Brahmanandam Paramasukadam Kevalam Gyanamurtim Dwanduatitam Gangana Sadrisham Tatuamasya Dilaksham Ekam Nityam Vimalam Achalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavatitam Trigunarahitam Sadgurum Tam Namami Hello, welcome. Pay very close attention to these teachings. They are from a work of Adi Shankaracharya, Viveka Chudamani, and it is Advaita Vedanta. So this, these are the teachings that you find in the scriptures. They are according to the scriptures. So pay very attention to these teachings. Listen very carefully to these teachings. Then you should reflect upon them reflecting a lot upon these teachings and then meditate upon these teachings so that they may bear fruit in your heart. Moving on, verse 546. He who has false knowledge feels pleasure and pain, good and evil. He who has broken all connections with the body and has identified himself with the self, where is there any good or evil or their results for him? So, he who has false knowledge, that means he who has identification with the body, connection with the body, feels pleasure and pain, good and evil. But he who has broken all connections with the body and has identified himself with the self, the one who is always absorbed in the self, where is there any good or evil or their results for him? Because all these results, they are for the body alone. So the one who has cut the connection with that body, where are those for him? It is the shadow of the earth that falls upon the sun. But the ignorant who don't know the real nature of the thing say the sun is swallowed by the dragon, although really it is never swallowed. In like manner, the fool, seeing this knower of Brahman, thinks he is the body, though he is free from all bondages of body and all. So the fool, the one who doesn't know who he really is, looks at the knower of Brahman, at the body where the knower of Brahma is expressing whatever, and he thinks the body is the knower of the Brahma, that he is still that body. And he attributes all the actions of the body to the knower of Brahma when he is always free from the body. He remains with the body just as a cast off skin of a snake taken here and there by the vital forces. So the, the skin that a snake has dropped is blown away here and there by the winds. So this body is taken here and there apparently by the pranas and he is there with it but not part of it, not part of the body. The log is taken along the course of the water in places high and low. And so the body of this nor of Brahman is led in the enjoyment of things by the will of the Lord, according to actions done in the past. So the same karma that brought that, this body into existence is taking it all along, through all experience, through all enjoyments, 
by the will of the Lord and the prarabdha. So it is his prarabdha, that karma that brought this body to existence, that continues to drive it. Like that log goes through the course of waters, through that pre-established course, and it just follows it till the end. So does this body follows according to the prarabdha karma until it ends. The rest of the karma that has not been, that has not manifested is burned in self-realization. So what is observed is the movement of the body, not the knower of Brahman. Why does he do all these things? This free soul, according to the desires of Prarabdha Karma, enjoys objects like a man of the world, but always established in Brahman. He remains quiet as the witness, like the pivot of a potter's wheel, free from all motion. So a common person may wonder, why does he do all these things? If he is an awakened one, why is he doing all these things? Observing the body and thinking the body to be that knower of Brahma. This free soul, according to the desires of Prarabdha Karma, that karma that brought the body into existence, enjoys objects like the men of the world, unworried. He is enjoying them, so it seems. Others are seeing it, enjoying it like anyone else. But the difference is, he is always established in Brahman. He remains quiet as the witness. The body is moving, is enjoying, he is quiet. So like the pivot of a potter's wheel, the wheel is turning, the pivot is motionless. So it is with the knower of Brahman. The body is enjoying, unworried, but he is motionless, tuned, constantly tuned. He is Brahman alone. This knower of Brahman neither engages his senses in their objects of enjoyment, nor disengages them. He doesn't interfere. He is not the body. The body engaged, the body disengages, he doesn't interfere, but remains as witness, nor does he enjoy any results, whatever, of their actions. If he is not prompting them, he will not enjoy them. Being always intoxicated with the drink of that nectar of perpetual bliss. So, he is not interfering with engaging or disengaging. He is not exerting control over the body. He was before self-realization. He was controlling the body for the purpose of self-realization. Once that purpose is fulfilled, he is no longer controlling the body. So, you may see uh, an ore of truth, for example, an ore of Brahman, completely engaged in pleasures like someone else, or apparently in a controlled state, controlling the senses. But that's according to the Prarabdha. If he has been an ascetic for all, for many time, for a lot of time, that, that will be the, the sanskars of that body. If he hasn't, he hasn't. But sometimes there's even other reasons for what is, what is being exemplified, but that's something else. <clears throat> So he neither engages nor disengages. He doesn't interfere. He is not exerting control over the body because he already knows that he is not the body. Knows because he is merged in Brahman, constantly in Brahman, not because he heard it somewhere. He gives up all aims and ends, pains and pleasures, and remains in the Supreme always. He is the direct personification of Shiva, the best of knowers of Brahman. <coughs> Shiva is known to be motionless, and he is the best of the knowers because, well, he is Brahman. Living in this body, always free, perfect, the best of men, at the destruction of the Upadis, being one with Brahman all along, he is said to become Brahman, the non-dual.
become in a sense that that body dies, but he will not change. He will become Brahman, but he, he was already Brahman. Identity will not change. Only the Upadis will disappear. It is only the presence or absence of dress that makes the different characters assumed by the actor. The man remains always the same. So this knower of Brahman is always Brahman, not separated from him, no matter in what name or form. So it is only the different bodies and names of those bodies that make up the differences. The identity which is behind it is always the same. And the knower of Brahman has realized his own real identity and he is Brahman. No matter where it is, in what body it is seen or imagined to be seen. A leaf falling from the tree becomes dry. So the body of this knower of Brahman is burnt in the fire of the knowledge before he becomes Brahman. So in Samadhi, Upadis get burnt. What is left is just appearances. Like the, the leaf that falls from the tree. Because the tree, in this case, is the tree of ignorance. But this example, for the thoughtful, who remains always in its own self, always filled with the one eternal bliss, there should not be any consideration, whatever time, place, or circumstance in giving up this body, this lump of skin, flesh, bones, and filth. For, so the one who is always immersed in his own self, there cannot be any consideration about the body, where will it be dropped, about any of it, because he is not the body. He is always immersed in his own self. The giving up of this body is not liberation. Death of the body is not liberation. Nor is the giving up of the danda and kamandalu, staff and water pot. This is an ex a, a comparison, a metaphor. The staff and pot represents the physical body. And in this case, the physical body that holds the staff and the pot represents the self. So by giving up the body, there's no liberation, as much liberation as one gets from letting go a staff and a water pot. But the breaking of the knots of the heart caused by avidya is liberation. In ditch or in river, in churchyard, or in the field, wherever the leaf may fall, what is that to do with the tree? But the tree here is not the tree of ignorance. Now it represents Brahman. So whenever the, the, the leaf, that body, lifeless body, falls, it makes no difference for the tree. So the knower of Brahman is the knower that he is a tree. He is not mistaken to be a leaf that is falling down. Like the destruction of a leaf, a flower or a fruit is the destruction of the body, senses, vital forces, mind, intellect and all. But not of the Atman, of him who stays always in the ever blissful state, he remains like a tree. The consolidation of consciousness is the distinguishing feature of the Atman. That is true. The Upadis that are generated from nascence dies. So the Atman is eternal. Only the Upadis, that which appears, they die because they disappear. Oh, this Atman is immortal. This is the declaration of the scriptures as to immortality. Oh, of the Atman, even in the midst of everything that undergoes change and dies. So the pupil now is wondering, what self-contradiction do you speak? Now you say it dies, and then it is deathless. Now you say oneness, and then we see so much variety. 
is a strange contradiction. No, the stone, tree, grass, paddy, husk, etc., when burnt, become one form, ashes. So the body senses, vital forces, mind, and other, other, and all other appearances on being consumed in the fire of knowledge become Brahman, because Brahman is the, sus the substance, only the form changes. As the darkness apparently separates, apparently, as the darkness merges in the rays of the sun, so all appearance subsides in Brahman. So all appearances appear in the background, which is Brahman, and then they disappear into Brahman again. As when the pitcher is broken, the sky in the pitcher becomes one with the sky outside. So with the destruction of the Upadis, the knower of Brahman becomes Brahman itself. So when the body dies, the identity remains the same for the knower of Brahman because it has emerged already. So there's no change in that. As milk poured into milk, oil into oil and water into water, mixed up and become one, so the knower of Brahman, the contemplative, the one who is con continuously tuned with Brahman, becomes one with Brahman. It doesn't become, it doesn't change. He is Brahman already. So just the body disappears. And the, the journey of that individual consciousness disappears. Here words... In this way, the sage attaining that oneness with Brahman, which is free from the body, one universal whole and the absolute reality, never comes back again. There's nowhere to come back to. The pupil then, what do you say? Never comes back. Where does he go? He must come back. He who comes back surely is not the Atman, that is the Upadi. Recognizing his identity with Brahman always, and that, and that way, burning the seeds of Avidya, he becomes Brahman. So how can there be any birth for Brahman? So whatever is appearing is the Upadis only. It's an appearance. It's a sheet of ignorance. Nothing else. There can't be any birth for Brahman, which is the eternal Again, what do you say? This bondage and, and liberation, they all belong to Maya. Virtually, they do not exist in the Atman, as in the case of the rope, free from change. There is no coming or going of the snake superimposed on the rope, says the disciple. They may speak of bondage or freedom according to the presence or absence of the covering identity. But again, there can be no covering for Brahman for want of a second. So there's no one apart from Brahman. So how can there be a covering? It is always uncovered. If you say there is any covering for Brahman, then you injure the scriptural truth of Advaita. The Shruti cannot bear duality. The pupil is puzzling and puzzling. Some maturity still needed. Okay, I will show you an example. This bondage or liberation, both of them are false. The qualities of the intellect. Fools attribute them to the Atman, as we impute to the sun the covering of the eyes by the clouds, because the Atman is one without a second, unattached, uniform, unconscious, unchangeable. So both liberation or bondage do not exist. Atman transcends, transcends it both. And fools, those who are ignorant, attribute him to the Atman. So they seek, identity seeks liberation because of their condition. Therefore, these two, bondage and freedom, are in Maya, not in the Atman, which is partless, actionless, quiet, free from impurities, spotless, without defect and stainless. How can there be any imagination in him who is non-dual, supreme and universal like the sky? 
there is no birth nor death, neither bondage nor aspirant, neither one desires of liberation, nor one liberated. This is the ultimate truth. So that which is called the liberated is the Upadis observed by the Upadis. And the one who is, was seeking liberation and the one then which is recognized as liberated, they are not real. There is no such thing. This is the ultimate truth. But let's remember that this is a conversation that it's happening between the master and the disciple. The master is explaining. So, many confusions are made with this. I have shown you today the secret of the highest decision of all the scriptures and my own realization. This is supreme and most mysterious indeed. Thou too must speak this unto one who is desirous of liberation. The master is saying to his self-realized pupil, convinced that he has fulfilled all his duties and is bereft of all defects whose mind has become free from all desires. So this highest realization now it is the time for the pupil that became a master to, to speak about this. To the one who is desirous of liberation and nothing else. To this one he should speak, not to others. And to the one who convinces him that he has fulfilled all his duties and is bereft of all defects, whose mind has become free from all desires. What is more rare, an awakened one or someone who his mind has been free from all desires? But in this case, all worldly desires, it is saying. But the desire for liberation has to be there intensely. All the rest has to disappear or be overthrown by this uh, bigger desire. Hearing this word of the Master and bowing down to him with all reverence, with his permission and blessing, the disciple departed free from all bondage. And the Master too, with his mind always merged in the ocean of bliss, went away in order to purify the world. What a pretty sight. Thus the realization of the Atman is established in the form of a dialogue between Master and Disciple for the easy realization of those who are desirous for liberation. This teaching is godlike indeed. May those who have been absolved from all the impurities of their hearts by the performance of their duties, who have ceased to find pleasure in sense enjoyments, whose minds have become pacified, who take delight in the spirit of the scriptures, who have controlled the senses, who desire liberation, may they take delight in it. Sure, this teaching is godlike indeed. I will repeat this again. So this teaching, it is for those who are ready for it, not for anyone, not for everybody. It is for those who are ready for them, for the selected few. For those who have been absolved from all impurities of their hearts by the performance of their duties, their worldly duties, and who are embracing the ultimate duty, which is of liberation but not running away from the world, who have ceased to find pleasure in sense enjoyments, who have understood the nature of sense enjoyments, who have seen that these sense enjoyments bind, bind them to suffering. They are only suffering alone. So they don't want it anymore. 
whose minds have become pacified, exactly by that not wanting them anymore, who have, ta who have take, the, who take the light in the spirit of the scriptures, in the reading of the scriptures, into the spiritual practices, who they take the light already. They are not in the state that the spiritual practices and the teachings cause them misery. That nature has been cleansed already. Who have control over the senses. Who desire liberation. May they take the light in it. Surely this teaching is godlike indeed. For those who are suffering very much from the effect of the heat of the sun, its rays, and on the road to this of this world, wandering the desert of the expectation of water, wearied, this book is the nearest ocean of nectar, very pleasant, that shows the non-dual Brahman, may the instruction of Shankara, which is the way to bliss of Nirvana, be successful. So, if you don't find these qualities in you, it doesn't mean that you're not worthy of this teaching, but it means that before trying to grasp over this teaching, you may even try it, but develop these, arrive at this level that it was described in this uh, previous verse, then these teachings will bear fruit. I didn't show the book because uh, I don't want to create any more expectations about the book, who wrote the book, and all of that. Just the teachings were presented because they are the main thing. So may you take the best out of these teachings and elevate yourself beyond the level where you stand at this moment. May you yourself become fully liberated, established in Brahman alone. My blessings are upon you. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.